if everybody makes the effort for all these children to get to know everybody's cultures, wow, I mean, that's what we want. We want our children to, I mean, they are global citizens. So let's us make the effort of doing that. Welcome to the Unapparent Podcast, the place that delivers deeply human stories about the unapparent truths of parenting. My name is Katia Reyero Lindor, and I am your host. Join us as we debunk myths surrounding parenthood and provide an empathetic, judgment-free space for parents and parents to be. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Unapparent Podcast. Our guests today um, were actually kind enough to have me on their podcast for an episode. Um, they have a podcast called Mamas Cuatro Once. Um, and it's, is it a fully Spanish or also a bilingual podcast? Fully Spanish. Fully Spanish? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. well, Maritere and Erika, I know our episode was in Spanish. I wasn't sure if you did a, a little combo. But um, thank you so much for being on our podcast today and an, an English episode, um, which pro probably a little different for you guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah, really excited. Thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, yourselves, how many children you have, um, where you live, your occupations, all of those things? Um, Maritere, you can go first and then Erika. Uh, I'm Maritere Velas. Thank you so much for having us here today. It's an honor to be with you again. Um, and I have been, um, I'm a children's book author, um, uh, but I have been a language and cultural advocate for over two decades. I have a 31-year-old and a 34-year-old that we raised with uh, two languages and three cultures. My husband is Greek-American. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, like you, and uh, then I like venture out to California uh, to get a master's degree, and I ended up with the master and the mister, and oh. I made a life in up in California, and uh, yeah, and here I am. I create content uh, for parents that are raising bilingual, multilingual, multicultural children, and like I say, I'm a book author. I have a podcast, and I do all that. Be kind of became a resource for parents in, in this in this community of raising children with two or more languages and two or more cultures. Thank you. And Erika? Hi, my name is Erika. I'm originally from Argentina. I'm an educational psychologist, and uh, I've been living in a couple of different countries, raising my kids uh, a little bit around. Uh, I have been living in France for a long time where uh, my kids were born. Uh, living a couple of years in Canada, and I have been in the States, in New York City, for around 12 years now. My kids are 17 and 20, and we had a, a very nice journey uh, raising them bilingual, and I think now uh, it's, been a, it's been a while where they are the ones enjoying uh, this situation, right? Having these second and third languages. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, thank you so much for, for sharing that um, about, you know, both of you and your your children's upbringing. Right. Um, which brings me to a point that we we discussed when I was on your podcast. Um, I mentioned uh, during that re recording that um, I am raising and, and a lot of us in this day and age are raising children away from our village. Right. Um, and this idea of it takes a village to raise children, yet so many of us are raising children, right? Kind of far from our village many times. Um, what was that like for for you guys in, you know, uh, we are from different generations. And so I do feel that that's something that we do have in, in common. And it may be the times were different, but I'm sure the challenges um, were pretty similar. So um, I'd just like to hear your your points of view on, on what that was like when you guys moved away and started raising a family away from your families. Well, that was probably the hardest thing I have ever done um, mm -hmm. to this day. I think about it and, you know, as you get older, um, I'm sure you, you can have this conversation with your mom and she would tell you that maybe some of the things that decisions that she made then 
she probably would have made a different decision, uh, you know, 20, 30 years later. Uh, but, you know, you, you do the best you can. I did the best I could. I, neither my husband nor I had family in California. So um, we didn't have children for about five years. So we kind of um, developed friendships uh, and I gravitated to uh, friends that were Latinos. You know, I didn't have a lot of Puerto Rican friends there either. Uh, mostly the the Spanish language community was either Mexican or from Central and South uh, Central America. Uh, but I started meeting more people that you know that were Latinos. That you know, five years later when we had children, they kind of became my village, if you will. But it was very different because we did not live close to each other. So it wasn't like I could see them all the time either. We had to plan, okay, so maybe two or three times a month, we would get together with each other. Um, and the beauty was that all of us, there were like three of us, three or four of us, we all started having kids around the same time. So at least our kids were growing up together. So I feel like my children, um, at the same time that they were learning about the Greek culture, the Puerto Rican culture, and obviously the American culture, they also were exposed to Argentinian culture and Peruvian culture and Mexican culture. And that really helped. I mean, these women are my friends today, over 30 years later. Uh, they're my family. You know, it's like uh, the family that you choose uh, that people talk about. Uh, so that would be my best advice for, for parents uh, like you. It's kind of like you create that village uh, because I'm sure that if you're going through this, the neighborhood, ne the neighbor next to you might be doing it the same way or people that you meet at your kid's school when they start preschool um, and you just can kind of like, you know, gravitate to each other and, and form this, this family uh, of people that are in the same boat as you and you you get to be supportive of each other to the point where when they when you meet people closer to you like in your neighborhood and you you know trust them you start you know helping each other out so you and your husband want to go on a little date down the street to have coffee you can leave your kids with people that you trust because that's the other thing it's like how do you have dates with your husband if you know you can't trust people anybody to, to stay with your kids. So it's, you know, it's a lot of uh, intuition and a lot of wanting to put yourself out there. Uh, remembering that there's, there are other people that are going through the same thing as you. That's very true. And, and going back to, to what you said about um, your kids being exposed to so many cultures that's you know so beneficial to people in 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 your growth in in just your knowledge of of the world and awareness of other of other cultures that's just um so enriching for them so that's really cool that they had that experience um i'm sure erica can share some similar experiences right with multicultural yeah. raising kids absolutely and I absolutely agree with Marie Terry in the sense of you need that village uh, to survive because you can create it if it's if you can you cannot join one because you can't find it just just go open the doors of your house and get out and meet people and invite people to your village and you can create it uh, share all the resources you have at the time I was living in Paris I had one one of my kids and then the second one so with two toddlers i needed a ton of books and games there weren't any apps around at the time uh but there were so many things we could share and exchange with other people and also we wanted our kids to listen to other people speaking spanish although it wasn't the same argentinian spanish at home that the ones like we could hear, you know, from our neighbors, neighbors from Colombia or from Ecuador, but it was, that's the beauty of it, right? Uh, to also in our own language, find this mix, this richness, like we are uh, representing so many cultures and uh, it's, I think it's amazing. And for the kids, it's, it's a real opportunity to be raised in that, uh, you know, like that environment. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, that's so true. And and I, as I mentioned to to Maritere, it's it's such an enriching experience for children, right? At such a young age to be exposed to all of these um, cultures and languages. Um, it's something that I wish I had been a little more exposed to growing up. Obviously, I had the Spanish and the English. You know, as Puerto Ricans, we are innately already multicultural, right? Because we have the Puerto Rican culture, and being a territory of the U.S., we have the American culture. Um, but what um, lives Living in other countries, you know, for Marita in the U.S., for Erika eh, all over the place, right, um, all over the world. What how are some of the, the challenges that you face in raising um, multicultural, multilingual children um, away from your countries and families? Well, you know, it's it's it was hard for us to find, for example, restaurants that have Puerto Rican food that, that mm -hmm. did not exist. Um, uh, also restaurants that had Greek food, we had to kind of like go out and really search for them. We didn't have Google at the time, so it was all word of mouth or you went to the library and, you know, someone said, oh, I saw this ad about this Greek restaurant somewhere or, um, so it was hard. It was, it was really, it took, uh, effort, a lot of effort. Like today things are so much easier. You just Google you know, a Puerto Rican restaurant in my neighborhood and something will pop up, even if it's like two hours away, you know what I mean? But that did not exist. So I learned to uh, to cook. Um, I didn't know the Greek food at all when I met my husband. So my mother-in-law, bless her heart, she taught me and she gave me this recipe book and I, I love cooking. So it was kind of easy for me to do that, but some people don't like to cook. So, so you know, it takes more effort. You have to go out of your way to find festivals that we could take the kids to where they could see the folkloric dancing uh, from, you know, the Greek culture and the, you know, Puerto Rican music, you know, it took, you know, I had to play the music at home. The one thing also that is different from me than from both of you, and I know Erica knows this, my husband didn't speak Spanish either. So I was the only input. Um, so that's why it, it took a lot more effort. And it was hard. It was very easy to give up because I didn't feel the support. I didn't feel, I didn't have many resources. Uh, I did my best. You know, I always tell parents even today, um, raising bilingual children is not perfect. And it's not the same in any house. It's it's very different. That's why it's is you know it's hard, but um, it takes a lot of effort, and you have to want to do it. It has to be intentional. It has to be consistent but flexible. You know, you take the little wins. I, I took every little win that I had because I I you know didn't have my husband speaking Spanish to me in front of the kids. So if I went, if I went the whole day without speaking in English with the kids, that was a win for me because I would tend to speak in English so we could all communicate with each other. Uh, so, you know, it's not easy, but uh, today's parents like you are definitely raising multicultural children. Doesn't matter where you are. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, I really tell the parents, you know, worry about raising your kids. They haven't, they know your culture, your heritage cultures, but also expose them to other cultures. Maybe El Vecino, you know, the neighbor is Asian or the other neighbor is from India or, you know, once the kids start going to school, you'll see that when your daughter starts school, there's going to be so many kids in that school that are from different cultures and what a beauty, what, how wonderful for these kids that are, you know, being raised. And if their parents like I was that made the effort, if everybody makes the effort for all these children to get to know everybody's cultures, wow. I mean, that's what we want. We want our children to, I mean, they are global citizens. So let's us make the effort of doing that. You don't have Puerto Rican restaurants cook Puerto Rican food so that the kids learn to appreciate it. We would go to Puerto Rico every summer 
for two months, I parked myself in my parents' house and at least they were exposed to the, the smells and the cooking and the talk, you know, how como la gente siempre, you know, they're all talking away and, and the, the loudness of it all and the hugs and el calorcito, all, all of that. Uh, but there's people that don't have that privilege. That was a privilege and I never took it for granted. I appreciate it immensely. But we also have to remember Regardless of how much you try, if your kids are growing up somewhere else that is not in your native country, they are not going to love your native country the way you love your native country because you, you, you were there, you experienced it, you lived it, but they're here, they're in the United States or whatever country they're in. So, you know, you have to kind of be flexible and do the best that you can. Yes. And it, and it is a lot easier uh, nowadays with, you know, YouTube and you can just Google up, um, as you said, not just restaurants, but like the dancing. My, my daughter loves to dance. And, you know, it's something I hadn't even thought about, like for me to expose her to types of dances that I don't know, I can't teach her. I can't teach her flamenco and I can't teach her, you know, like bomba from Puerto Rico. And, you know, so many dances that I that she's already been exposed to because she has YouTube. She can see the videos of professional dancers dancing correctly and and she loves it and it's so enriching for her also because i love putting all kinds of music i can play the classical music for her because i play the violin but you know i'm not playing every day and so I, you can put on any kind of genre from any kind of country um and it's much easier and accessible and the visual of them being able to see like the videos of the dancing, you already feel like you're exposing them somewhat to your culture or to other cultures, right? Um, and you don't have to go out of your way to find a festival the way Marita was talking about, um, which is something that, you know, silly me, I hadn't even like thought of, wow, in this day and age, how much easier that is. Um, even though there's nothing like, you know, going and visiting, right, the country um, or wherever it is and getting to experience that like firsthand, it still is um, a game changer in terms of plain exposure, right? Um, and I'm sure Erika also has um, something to say about, about this. <laughs> Absolutely. My experience in France at the time, and I'm talking about like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, where I couldn't find a lot of Latinos around in my neighborhood, at least. Uh, so it was more of, you know, creating the community. And as, as soon as I, you know, met someone, I will invite them. I will offer also to exchange the resources we had at the time, like books, you know, uh, CDs. <laughs> That's what music was all about. Uh, DVDs, VHS, like, you know, that looks like really an, an old fashion thing but my kids are only 20 years old so like it's it doesn't you know it looks far but not that far so that was very interesting and the other thing was uh trying also to understand the culture where my kids were raised uh because that's also you know a message for our kids as much as we want our culture to be respected and uh, you know, people don't not to look at us like, where are you from? You're weird people. So you also have to interact and embrace the, the culture of the place you you're living in. So uh, for me, one of the first things was uh, to learn the songs of the kindergarten because I didn't know the songs in French. So I could also bring it home, uh, sing, sing them with my kids and also that way will be uh, where we could communicate of what happened during the day with them when while we were separated because they were I was at the office they were at the at kindergarten so um, so that was very interesting I think it's it's important to just not get on our you know on like bubble and get out there. Correct, um, and I think one of the things that I um, admire about you know, you two specifically is um, that was something you had to go out of your way to do, right? As we've talked about, it's uh, much easier to do in this day and age. And yet we still see, unfortunately, um, the lack of acceptance of other cultures, other norms, um, at least in this country. Um, I can only speak from experience here. I've never lived anywhere else other than Puerto Rico, you know. So um, that's something that is really valuable to kind of remind 
people and as parents it's our job if if we're not exposing them because you know we don't have the means to travel at least educating them at home about you know other cultures and what it means to be accepting of um, other people other religions other ways of life uh, other norms of living right um, and that's just key in in raising empathetic and kind humans right we want them to be citizens of the world who not only know and understand but embrace all people from all walks of life right um so such a great um example of of just moms who've who've done that and your kids are older now so i think you can attest to the product that you've um that's resulted in right um i'm still not there yet we are <laughs> still in the beginning stages of things and it feels challenging and it just feels like am i even doing the right thing am i gonna see the fruits of what I'm trying to instill in them. And, you know, we it, we question ourselves as mothers like every day. Um, you will. So, yeah. Thank you. I will trust take those words and you keep will. them here. Yes, you will. And trust me, I'm still questioning myself and my kids are in their 30s. So it it's a mom thing. <laughs> I remember my mom told me that the day that my son was born and, you know, I'm breastfeeding and she's over there watching me and she's like, you know, I'm going to be the first one to tell you that from this day forward, you will never sleep really soundly ever again, because no one's going to tell you that, but I feel like I need to tell you that. And it's so true. It's like, you know, even when your kids, you know, leave the house and go on and have their own lives, you're always going to be a mom and you're always going to question, but you and everyone listening you we all do the best we can as parents you know whether it's raising bilingual or disciplining them or you know having uh, um, uh, the family relationship and the bonding and the connection we all do the best we can and um and that's i think that's the message is um just trust yourself you know your child better than anyone you know yourself better than anyone and if you feel along the way and here we are you know moms that our kids are older to here to tell you ask for help you don't have to go through this alone in any aspects of parenting so you know that's my two cents yeah that's very valuable definitely asking for help is something that doesn't come easily to a lot of people I've realized um, and the notion that we have to do everything ourselves you know before becoming a parent that's what I thought being a parent was you know as a mom I have to do everything myself because that's what I saw my mom doing and that's what I see you know maybe p other mothers from your generation for example um, I just saw so much like no I got to do this myself and this is a me thing and you know if not me who and of course we feel as as parents no one's going to raise our kids the way we're going to raise them right so we can do the best job really and at the same time being open and accepting of the right kind of help that's something my sister-in-law told me which really um rung true to me because there's help and there's help right sometimes families are complex and i've realized that sometimes you feel judged by certain members whether it's of your family or uh, friends or whatever and so the right kind of help will always make you feel like you're not doing anything wrong like yes of course i will take your kids for an hour you do no matter what it is that you're using that time for i'm just being supportive of you right it's not the judgy kind of like mm, look at you you weren't working out for an hour and you could be with your kid instead you know like there's different, there's help and then there's like help that's just kind of counterproductive because you still feel icky about leaving your kids with whatever person, right? So that was some sound advice I got from my sister-in-law and then something I really like talking about, um, I mean, I love t talking about parenting with moms from all walks of life, right? But particularly you two being from um, the boomer generation, I'm curious to know your, your points of view on what it is that you think us um, as millennial parents are either doing well or maybe not so well we could improve in, um, <laughs> if you have any thoughts there. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I'm not here to judge anyone um, mm -hmm. because I'm a mom and I will always be a mom and I appreciate what it is like 
And so I, I, I don't, you know, I would never look at you and say, oh my God, Katya, you're doing this wrong. Or, you know, uh, if you ask for my advice, I would tell you, this is what I would do but not because you're doing it wrong. There's really not a right or wrong. I think we, yeah. like I said earlier, don't you think, Erika, we're all doing the best we can. And I, I think your generation has so much more information and resources than I did that I think that you are more knowledgeable than I was at your age. When, you know, when I was a mom at your age, I didn't know all the things that you do today. So if anything, you would be the one telling me what you think, you know, oh, well, you did it that way. Maybe you shouldn't have, or you should have done this day. So, you know what I'm saying? It's like, there's, I appreciate uh, the the moms, today's moms. And I think that uh, we, you know, we're all doing the best we can. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that I would say the main challenge now in the area of, you know, social media is like nothing and never is enough. So your room is never, you know, people show a lot like the perfect life, the perfect food, the perfect, yeah. you know, lunchbox, the room, everything is that, you know, tidy and everything like you, we all know that that, That's that doesn't not life. exist. <laughs> like it, it exists for five minutes. You organize your house and in two minutes, the kids come and put their things all over. And that's the beauty of it. Some parents, you know, enjoy that more than others, but that's the beauty of it. So I think the danger side of that is like comparing ourselves a ton. Like saying, oh, I should be doing healthier uh, lunch boxes. I, I mean, I'm, you know, this is the second or this is the second dinner in a row. I'm preparing pasta. So like, I'm like, okay, right. You know, like it's true that pasta every night is not the best. But if you have done that for two, you know, nights in a row, that's not terrible either. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's because we, I mean, it's easier to compare, uh, you know, styles that mm -hmm. uh people feel more judged and the other thing is the cultural shock it's a little bit about what Mary Terry was talking about is generational and cultural right because we live in a different country we were raised in a different way uh we knew things differently and sometimes when we are a little bit more open-minded we discover that maybe some things we thought they were great from our country they were good but not great because in our new country, uh, we find things like maybe they figure it out better. You know what I mean? Like, so we have to be more flexible and also different ages and steps in the way of, you know, in this beautiful path. <laughs> uh, it's, it, you know, they call for different strategies. It's not the same thing when you have kids, uh, you know, teenagers, toddlers. So I think we also learn in that way and we keep learning. Um, and I think from other moms and also from our kids. And I think we have to be a little bit more supportive of our own, you know, uh, yeah. motherhood and uh, how we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I totally agree. I It makes being a mother, right? Bec becoming a parent makes you so much more empathetic for other parents starting with your own parents, right? I'm like, oh wow, all of the things that I thought I could judge my mom um or criticize that she could have done better or differently you know now that i'm a mom it's like mm, maybe i see why she did things this way you know yeah, and my crazy. grandmother always said and my mom always repeat, repeated what my grandmother said that um you know you should be a parent before you're a child so that you can really grasp and understand but you know that's not how how life works so always there's always that aha moment later on when you become a parent where you're like ah oh, this is what my mom was talking about like 20 years ago you know or so um but yeah uh, back to erica's point about um being more open-minded and i think that's one of the beauties and benefits of raising multicultural children is that you teach them that there's not just one way of life right 
there's not just one way of doing things and that doesn't mean that one way is better or not right but you there's always room to grow and to learn and to embrace um and yeah everyone's different everyone has their preferences so you choose kind of your preference based on right that but um part of i understand part of being kind is just really being empathetic and, and open right um so i'm wondering what are some of the ways you've been able to identify um with your children right that you were successful um in raising you know or in imparting this knowledge um on your on your children um it, uh, again i know we question did we do it right even to this day right but I know that your kids are probably amazing because of who their mom is, right? So, or their moms are. So, um, if you could just share a little bit of your, you know, experience and, and wisdom now that you have older kids. Um, well, you know, I think that, um, we need to teach our kids, our children that they're not the center of the universe, that there's a whole world out there. And they are kids like them, being raised by parents like them, uh, and all the parents are doing the best they can. And and I think that when you raise kids to appreciate other cultures, other ways of life, um, you know, my kids are thirty. I think I mentioned that to you, thirty-one and thirty-four, and they they see you, they see you as a person. They don't see the color of your skin. They don't see whether you are gay or lesbian or they, they just see you as the person. And I think that's what we want to teach our kids. They're compassionate, they're kind, they're tolerant. And that all starts way early, like really young. And, and I, I want to believe that we, we all did that when the minute we bring this baby home, um, when they become adults, they become that adult that, you know, you will be, you're going to be proud of that they're, they're tolerant, they're compassionate, they're kind. They see someone that needs help. They run over and help. Um, you know, I, I think that's what we want. And I think that's, I think my husband and I did that well. Um, my kids are good people. They're good people. They're thoughtful. Uh, they care about others. Uh, they value friendship that, comes from me. I mean, I've, I think I'm a really good friend to my friends. So, you know, my daughter is an amazing friend and all her friends adore her. And, um, so I, I just think that it starts from, from the house. I couldn't agree more, you know, like they are watching us all the time. Um, uh, and that's, uh, for like, for the good and the bad moments. So, um, I think they, Everything is important, but mostly those messages about tolerance, being empathetic, they're on the small things. Uh, when you go to the park, when you're on a, well, in, a, in my case, when you're, you're, on, you're in the subway and uh, you let other people in before you, you, you show an example of how you, you know, you go around uh, people in the streets, uh, you know, waiting in line for your coffee or to buy something. Yeah. All these little things, like Marie Terry said, the world doesn't, you know, it's not only a, like about you. It's around a lot. Of, it's about you and around you. So, but this is again, step by step. You can't absolutely tell that to a kid that it's too in the middle of the tantrum, you know, like there are moments and moments. So like where we can educate and send this message and then also, you know, be open to conversations. And to conversations we usually as parents try to avoid because we try to avoid some subjects without noticing, like, you know, without really being aware of, especially when they start being like, you know, preteens or teenagers and they confront you and they say, why did you did that? And like, you know, we have this conversation, I think just to be open and, uh, and you can explain yourself why you chose this or that, why you move countries, why you speak Spanish at home and why that you don't feel that it, it's a terrible, you know, mistake or that, you know, for them uh, to go to, you know, uh, a school during the weekends or after school to 
learn another language is not a terrible thing. They will appreciate it in the future, yes, but they need an answer today because we put a lot on, on the kids about, uh, you know, it would be great for you after. Yeah, but they have to go through that. So uh, so it's not easy for a kid to see that. And as Marie Terry, I can also tell you that my kids appreciate a lot now and they say it out loud, uh, a lot of the things. Yes. And, and I want to say one more thing, Katya, in, in your case, in, you know, parents like you and your husband, um, you guys are, you know, uh, celebrated. You are, you have a position that not all the other parents do, not very many parents do. And you are such a role model. I mean, I, I'm going to tell you this in front of, you know, because Eric and I talked about this after we we interview you we were both so impressed with you i i have to tell you super impressed i think you are uh, a, an amazing young woman your parents did an amazing job so proud of you proud that you're puerto rican um, and i don't know your husband but i can imagine that he's pretty much the same from my sister that lives in puerto rico i hear that he is a door in the island so i can just see that so my point is that you can be, you are a great example for your daughters uh, because you're not only her, their parents, but you have this position that people look up to you. And so the way that you are going to handle all this fame, if you will, for lack of a better word, um, it's going to be super important. So just keep you know, keep being the way you are. You're doing an amazing job. And, and that's, that's what you want. You want your kids to look up to you as mom and dad, but they're going to see that others admire you as well. And, and she can, she can just say, they're just my mom and dad. You know what I mean? Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. That means so much. Yes, I appreciate that so much. Um, thank you. Thank you both uh, for your insight as well. Um, I know as um, younger generations, um, we, you talked about tolerance, right? Um, Erika, I think you mentioned it. And that's a word that I think is so important because I also, it's a two-way street, right? I had an elderly grandmother who didn't know anything about technology. She grew up in you know 1920s 1930s 1940s obviously it's a different world and if we had more tolerance right all across the board but as younger generations kind of lose tolerance for older generations who can't keep up with the way the world has so rapidly evolved right um it's it it that kind of the gap uh, between generations just is exacerbated um, because then you don't have the younger people willing and wanting to teach the older generations and being patient with them and tolerant. Um, and granted, you know, some elder people are stuck in their ways and they don't want to get out of it and they don't want to learn new things. And, you know, that's fine. That's their journey. But for those who who do, who actually are very, you know, well-intended and they want to learn um, things that it was a different time. They weren't taught that it's, you know, they're not up to date with what's, you know, what's trending or what's new or what's the norm now. Um, like it's a two way street. As I said, it, it takes openness from both sides to really come to, you know, to, to lessen the gap between generations. Um, and I say this cause it just, it reminded me, um, of my grandmother, right. And how, we had to have particular amount of patience to to kind of help her through the the technology barrier um and as parents now with little kids it takes so much patience right and i'm sure they're gonna lose patience when i'm older and then they know how to do things and they're like mom why, why don't you know this and i see it because i do it with my mom and you know i i really try to put myself in her shoes and i'm like i'm gonna be there one day where my kids are just making me feel like old and useless um and you know i like i like being empathetic to to older generations because they've been there they've done that they've had some you know wisdom that we don't have and sure maybe they're a little behind with some things but i feel like i'm getting there now i'm like oh i, I thought i was tech savvy no longer think that because i'm not like 
I'm not the, the younger generation that's doing things, you know, their way. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say that you, the, the fact that you guys are out there, have your podcast and you're still exposing yourselves and, you know, just doing what you do is it's not it's I don't I don't lose sight of, you know, what what that is for for us, the younger generations who can still learn from you and, and look up to you. Um, so, you know, thank I wanted you. to thank you in return as well. Thank you. It's it's a challenge for all generations, you know, mm -hmm. and I think we need to find a common ground where we all enjoy that has love like, oh, OK, I need to log in and I need to. So <laughs> how to make it like a little bit more fun, which is mm -hmm. not so obvious, but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, um, I don't want to take any more of um, your time, but one last, if you have any um, words of wisdom for parents who um, would just want to continue raising multicultural, multilingual children in this day and age, um, any wisdom you have to share before we part? Just do it. Just preserve your language and your culture. One day your kids will appreciate it and will love you for it. Um, the doors that open up when you're bilingual or multilingual, when you are, when you know other cultures, you know, the benefits and the advantages are innumerable. So just do it. There is a lot of help out there these days, lots of communities on social media that can support you. Uh, so, you know, just, just do it. I think that, you know, we all want our children to we're like I think I said at the beginning wherever you are in the world you are raising a multicultural multilingual kid so just embrace it love it yeah I would just add like it's never too late some people said oh I didn't start when he was a baby we never you know listened to music in Spanish or I never read it's never too late I mean it, that's something that a lot of people say, well, you know, he's already three. Well, no, or he's already six. Just go and do it. It's better that than nothing. And it's like, and even if you started, you know, as a baby, uh, it's like, uh, you know, putting a GPS, then you are rerouting the whole time. That's the journey because you have to readjust because you are not the same because the kid is not the same uh, because then it's one kid and then comes the it's second two. one or the, and the third one and then the whole dynamic changes and your time to you know uh take care of everything also changes so it's like we are reinventing ourselves but just do it and enjoy it just enjoy this ride because it's important to enjoy it thank you yes thank you both so much i appreciate it thank you thank you for having us it's been like a real pleasure Oh, thank you thanks. so much. You're a doll. <laughs> oh, thank you till next time. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Gracias and thank you for listening to this episode of the Unapparent Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe as we release a new episode at least every month with an exciting new guest. Be sure to also follow us on Instagram for all the Unapparent content you never knew you needed. 